One blood. One life, you've got to do what you should. One life with each other. Sisters, brothers. One life, but we're not the same. We've got to carry each other. Does anyone know where those words come from? The band U2. Yes, the band U2. Yeah. Does anyone know the name of the song? <laughs> the song is called One. Yes, uh, they were penned by singer-songwriter Bono, one of the four members of the band U2. U2 happens to be my all-time favorite band. Their lyrics are deep and multifaceted, and if you haven't had the pleasure of being in their presence in a concert, it's a truly transcendent experience, and I don't use that term lightly. Reared on the streets of Dublin during the tumultuous 1960s and 70s, the members of U2 infuse both compassion and political action into their songs and into their lives. From Sunday Bloody Sunday about the violence in Ireland, to Pride about Martin Luther King Jr., to Iris, a song dedicated to Bono's mom who died of cancer while he was a teenager. For over 40 years now, U2 has been cranking out lyrics that attempt to connect people to a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose in their lives. And they do that by first acknowledging hardship and then singing about how to respond. Spiritually enchanting songs, like I still haven't found what I'm looking for in mysterious ways, can, on one hand, be heard just as love songs, and they're beautiful that way. But when heard another way, they become about spiritual yearning, reflecting the band's own journey with their Christian faith and social activism. So I could go on and on, for real, about you two. I just love them. I think their songs are amazing. I think the way they have shifted their tone over the decades has been fascinating. To me, all that they have stood for and striven for over the years is really top notch. But their words in one caught me this week as I was reflecting upon our passage for this morning. We have here a snippet of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Evidently, this church, or actually it was a cluster of small churches, were struggling with how works, things you do in your life, and adherence to the laws intersected. What does this mean when we think about being saved by faith? What does, where do works and law and being saved by faith tie in together? So if you ever want to treat us about how works and faith connect, I commend the entire book of Galatians to you. But for our purposes today, we have a small piece. And it's a one-two punch for us. First, we're told that we are in prison, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law. But then the part two, our faith has freed us, bringing us all together as one in Christ. So first the law, but now freed and made into one. Today is also Juneteenth, the day on which we honor and celebrate freedom from slavery at the conclusion of the Civil War. It's a day to remember, and I am so glad it's become a part of our national holidays and slowly but surely part of our nomenclature. And yet, Juneteenth commemorates the end of the Civil War, which is a full three years after the Emancipation Proclamation was first intended to free black slaves. Sometimes, freedom from an oppressive law takes time to become a reality. Freedom takes time. And of course, it only takes a passing glance at the news coming from our country to tell us that we still have an unbelievably long way to go in the areas of racial justice and equity. So Paul is writing to the Galatians to remind them of a few truths. You were once enslaved by this law, but those memories of enslavement are deeply embedded. Freedom from a law through faith or through the changing of a law might be one thing, but living into that freedom, that's something else. Chains don't just go away overnight. Those of us who tend towards being rule followers, it's easy to get caught up in the mind frame of Okay, if I do this all right, it'll work out. If I 
do it all right, if I do a good job at my profession, I will be promoted and promoted again. I'll make enough money to tend to my family. If I go to the right schools, I'll get that right job. If I get the grades first, then I'll go to the right schools and I'll get that job. If I listen to my parents, then I'll do the good grades and then I'll go to the school and get that good job. This continues on and on, right? And goes past our jobs too. It's in our relationships. If only I'm kind, this relationship will work out. If I obey the law, if I do it all right, I'll be justified. It'll all work out. Unfortunately, recent history has revealed that this is a deeply privileged stance to take in a lot of different ways. We can do it all right and things still fall apart. We can do it all right and still the doctor calls us with the unsettling diagnosis. We can do it all right and still find ourselves in a tumultuous relationship that leads to divorce. We can do it all right and still life throws us a curveball. And it is privileged. And I'm speaking now to those of us in the room and those of us watching online who are white. Folks, the whole if I do it all right and it will work out for me is not something our black and BIPOC brethren have historically been able to say. I remember when this first hit home for me. It was the first time I heard a black parent sharing about a conversation that apparently all black parents have with their children, particularly their black sons. What to do if you are pulled over by a police officer. The black parent continued, you keep your hands on the steering wheel, you're very polite, you answer the officer as calmly as you can, don't show anxiety or jumpiness, do not talk back, and keep those hands in plain view at all times. White parents in this room, how many of us have had to have that conversation with white children? Right? The idea of if I do it all right and all, it'll all work out is an old, old trap. The Galatians who thought that the law would save them knew it too. If we do it right, surely things will work out for us. But Paul was offering a different perspective. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are as children of God. So we're one, but we're not the same, says you two. Our common identity as children of God unites us, but that does not mean that we all walk the same road. We do not always believe the same things, nor are we of one mind in terms of what to do next as the church, as a group of people. In some ways, Juneteenth allows for that frank acknowledgement. Many of us cannot understand another person's road because we haven't lived it. I don't know any differently in this country other than what it means to grow up as a white woman. But we can, and I believe we are called, to have deep compassion. We can work on ourselves. We can listen deeply to the different notes of others so that our one song as Christians is not one noted, but is at least harmonious. And here's the kicker. Last week I spoke about the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and wisdom was there, right? That wisdom has been present to us every step of our lives, in our own selves, and binding us together as the church. The Spirit descended on Pentecost to each of us for the purpose of listening to each other, understanding each other and translating that truth to the world, that means that if wisdom is with us, we can reflect wisely upon the old tapes we might have been taught as children, wisely observe the culture in which we now live, wisely listen to those who have walked a different path. Wisdom is there. And then when called upon, wisdom speaks. Wisdom speaks in our own spirits, in ourselves, and in response to the status quo we find in our culture. In this Galatians passage, passage, Paul was encouraging his readers, and us today as well, to be expansive in how we view our faith and our connections to each other. We are all made one in that way. The law was for a time, and that time has passed. 
What a fitting text for Juneteenth. This is an emancipation day. Emancipation from the law of slavery that dominated our country for so long. For too long. And I would suggest today can be a hint towards the coming of God's kingdom. Where all kinds of laws that confine us will be abolished. Laws, I might add, that at least in our country were often made by straight white men who lived hundreds of years ago. Laws that, as we recall with a shudder, especially during Pride Month, used to tell us who we could or could not love, who we could or could not marry. Laws that told us that some of us were lesser than simply because of skin color. Laws that were made at the founding of our country and that are sometimes seen as absolute that cannot be changed. But today on Juneteenth, on this day and age, we know better. We know that our faith is a freeing faith. Our faith is a faith rooted in deep love of all kinds, of all shades of the rainbow. We know that our faith and our belief in everyone's belovedness tells us that black lives matter. We know that while we hold rights, the right for our children to live matters. And it matters more. We know that loving this country deeply and dearly does not mean that laws cannot be changed. It means the opposite. As a democracy, we should always hold the law carefully and considerately with an understanding of historical context and a critical eye towards the intent and impact of every dot and tittle. That is spirit wisdom personified. And it is when people are being oppressed that wisdom is not only there, but speaks. On this day when we celebrate the ending of a terrible, terrible law, we remember. We remember that wisdom spoke that day in 1862 when Lincoln named his intention to free all enslaved people. We remember the day wisdom spoke on Juneteenth when it became official. We remember the days wisdom continues to speak when people who continue to be oppressed speak up to say no more for God's sake, no more for God's sake indeed. We remember the days when wisdom speaks through those of us who are privileged, owning it, and using our privilege to pipe down <laughs> and allow other voices that are usually muted to be amplified over ours. Our emancipation as people of faith can cause us to be free from our chains but that means naming and knowing the chains, which still threaten to bind us. Chains of racism and sexism and misogyny and heteronormativity and xenophobia and prejudice of any kind against any beautiful soul that God has tenderly crafted and made. Before faith came, we were imprisoned, guarded under the law. But now that faith has come, you all are children of God through faith. All are one in Christ Jesus. Beloved of God, on this Emancipation Day, may we remember. May we remember that we are one as the church, but we are not the same. May we remember that our story is not everyone else's, and that our understanding of things is not universal, mine included, by the way. If anyone disagrees with anything in this sermon, please come talk to me. I'm always happy to talk to you. I never believe that anything I say from here is necessarily a universal truth. May we remember that as the church we are one, that we hold on to the faith that unites us, the faith in Christ's redemptive and liberating power. Our world is but a dim reflection of that right now, but we have a role in making that reflection ever clearer as we grow in faith together, as we continue to talk about things, even if they're hard. May wisdom continue to speak through us. After all, as spiritual descendants of those who were present at Pentecost, we have a piece of that spirit fire too. One love, one blood, one life, you've got to do what you should. One life with each other, sisters, brothers, all siblings. One life, but we're not the same. We've got to carry each other, carry each other, one. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, one God, the God of our church,
who makes us one. 